This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4 through 8 in the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, and he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. And then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. And he looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. And so he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And we're speaking today from the subject simply, a nap and a snack. A nap and a snack. This is Elijah the prophet. He had just had this extraordinary ability as a prophet of God to be able to call down fire from heaven. He just had a gift of just being able to pray the fire of God down. And you know, he, they just had the showdown on Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal, the false prophets of Baal. And then he said, you know, if, if your God be God, let's, let's call down fire. And the God that answers by fire will be the true and the living God. And Elijah knew he had this one because he had an anointing to be able to pray down fire. And the others called on their gods and nothing happened. And then Elijah said, it's my turn. Let me show you what my God can do. And the God of Elijah answered by water. He said, not only am I going to pray, but he says, you couldn't even pray the fire down, but I'm going to have it saturated with water. Let me soak it with water to just show you that God's still able to do anything. And so they soaked it with water, and then he came, the fire fell, it licked up all of the water, it burned up everything, and he established himself as a true and living God. The 450 prophets of Baal were put to death. This angered King Ahab's wife, Jezebel. Now she's upset, and she says, Elijah, before the sun goes down tomorrow, you're going to be dead. She's issued out his death order. And now Elijah is running for his life. And this is where he comes to the wilderness. He's in the wilderness and he's depressed, sitting under a juniper tree or what the New Living Translation calls a broom tree. And he's taking a nap. And an angel of the Lord fixes him some food, and puts a jar of water there, wakes him up and says, get up and eat. And they fixed by a nap and a snack, and it changed his whole world. He still had the same problems, but a nap and a snack brought things into perspective. Yeah. While he was asking, you know, he says, God, take my life. Now, if he really wanted God to take his life, he would have stayed where he was because Jezebel was trying to kill him. <laughs> but he ran for his life. And then told God, you, you know, God kill me. So his actions defied his real sincerity when he was saying, kill me. He was depressed. He didn't really want to die. He was just depressed and burned out. But he needed a nap and a snack. And I know some people who want to murder folks, but they just need a nap and a snack. <laughs> some of you have seen the folks that are hangry. You've seen some of the Snickers commercial where you're one person and then you bite the, the Snickers and then you turn back into yourself. Because you're hangry because 
It reminds us of how we become just like babies who are irascible, easily upset whenever they're either sleepy or hungry. And my thing, if a baby is sleepy, why don't you just go to sleep? Why cry? Why irritate everybody else around you? Just go to sleep. But they start crying when they get sleepy and they cry when they get hungry. And we're about the same way. Whenever we need a nap, we're nasty, irritable, impatient, critical, snappy, <laughs> you know. And, and, and this is where Elijah the prophet was. He needed a nap and a snack. He was hangry, just hangry. And sometimes I want you to come to a place where you never underestimate the power of us, the spiritual power of a nap and a snack. Just a nap and a snack has the power to be able to bring some restoration and restore perspective and calm you down and make you so much more of a pleasant person and tame the beast in you, a nap and a snack. I know it sounds uh, simple, but not everything that is simple is easy. And this is all that the prophet teaches us here is the power of a nap and a snack. You've got to get your rest and you've got to get your nutrition. And this is where Elijah the prophet is giving us a life lesson that actually helps us in this day and time. He's giving us a pattern here. Sleep, eat, pause. Sleep, eat, pause. Sleep, eat, pause. And you have to learn how to respect the pause in life. People burn out because they don't know how to pause sufficiently. There's power in the pause. If you just put notes together and never have a rest, a pause, it is the thing that allows us to have rhythm. It's because of a pause. There must be a pause to make rhythm have sense to us. Otherwise, it's just legato. So it, if you're going to create beats, beats are created because it's, they're, they're different speed notes that then have rest built into them. And it is the rest that gives us the rhythm. When you lose your rest, you lose your rhythm. And you can't flow and be who you need to be in life if you don't get your rest. And when I was in ROTC, and we'd be marching, and sometimes a person, you know, the, the, the drill sergeant was, your left, your left, your left. And then sometimes there was always going to be somebody in the platoon who was on their right when they were calling left. <laughs> and they taught us that if you're on the wrong foot, how you had to do this little skip to get back on rhythm. And you had to rest and do this little skip in order to get you back on your rhythm. Because somebody was on their right when they were calling out their, your left. And you have to make an adjustment to be able to get back into your rhythm. You sleep, you eat, you pause. You sleep, you eat, you pause. A nap, a snack, and a pause. You have to learn how to practice the pause. Take your pause in life. This is what Elijah is teaching us, that when you're burned out, in fact, if you pause regularly, it'll keep you from burning out. If you do the right thing at the right time, it'll allow you to be able to, when you do have low places in life, if you've paused sufficiently, when you hit rock bottom, it turns rock bottom into a trampoline. And you have resilience and you pop, bounce back up. The great sin in life is not falling down. It's being able to have resilience to spring back. Yes, there are going to be some situations in life that are going to pull you down. You're going to have some disappointments that take you down. If you live long enough, it's not a matter of if you'll ever get down. It's a matter of how you will respond when you reach rock bottom. And if you have the right pause and the right position and the right perspective in your pause, it gives you resistance then to spring back. This is the power of the pause of where you take a nap, pause to take a nap and get a snack. 
and it renews your energy. But learn how whenever you feel overwhelmed about the pressures of life and the extenuating circumstances of life, take a pause. Take a pause whenever you're in doubt, pause. Whenever you're feeling lost, pause. Whenever you're feeling angry, pause. Whenever you're feeling frustrated, pause. Whenever you're feeling tired, pause. Whenever you're feeling confused, pause. Whenever you're feeling stressed, pause. And when you pause, pray. Whenever you're feeling these ways, pause and pray. Pause and pray. Pause. Sleep, eat, pause, pray. Sleep, eat, pause, pray. Walk through the process. It'll help you whenever you get into a burned out situation. And it can help you to prevent burnout in your life if you'll learn to just eat, sleep, pause, pray. The three fundamental pillars of health are sleep, nutrition, and exercise. You need all three of them. I've read books about sleep. I didn't realize how important sleep was. And some people who are workaholics pride themselves that, you know, well, you know, I only get four hours of sleep a night. You may be harming yourself because your body restores while you're asleep. Your cells rebuild and renew. It gives you greater clarity during the day. You can have blank outs over the process of the day because of sleep deprivation. Your immune system is impaired. I don't care how well you're eating if you don't get sufficient sleep. Sleep is medicine. Sleep, nutrition, exercise. Your body needs all three, a balance of the three of these. They are the three fundamental pillars of health. Get some rest, eat nutritious food, and get active. Get some rest, eat nutritious food, and get active. The moment that you come under stress, guess, what's, guess what happens? You don't feel like exercising. And you start craving the wrong kinds of food, high fat foods, sugar foods, salty foods. You get stressed, you want ice cream, you need a, a cake, some fried chicken. You start craving the wrong thing. If you come under stress, you need something that's going to make, take you, you know, mm, mm. but it's taking you in the wrong direction. Please understand this. Your diet is more than what you consume physically. Your diet is what you watch. Your diet is what you read. Your diet are posts that you follow. Your diet is what and who you listen to. Your diet is who you spend time with. And your diet is the atmosphere that you expose yourself to. Everything happens in an atmosphere. Every atmosphere that you go into has a vibe. And that's why you can get in a certain atmosphere and it starts sapping your energy. Or get in the right kind of atmosphere and it energizes you and heals you and puts your mind in the right place. Atmospheres feed you. You have to be in the right atmosphere. You're in an atmosphere of faith right now. Something ought to be building up on the inside of you. I'm glad that you're resting in your seat right now because you're also not only merely uh, having a snack, but you're, 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 you know, uh, you're, you're resting, but you're having a snack. Uh, the, the teaching, what, what you're feeding yourself right now. You're feeding your spirit, man. You're feeding your mind, your body, your mind, your spirit. You have to feed all dimensions of who you are. It's not just... Uh, you know, what you put in your mouth. Uh, when you understand diet, it's what you feed your mouth. It's what you feed your mind. And it has to do with the meditations of your heart. When your diet, it's your mouth, it's your mind. It's the meditation of your heart. It's your mouth, it's your mind. It's the meditations of your heart. It's your mouth, it's your mind. It's the meditation of your heart. And that's why it's so much more than just what you eat. It's who you are around. They are the posts that you follow. It's who you listen to. It's who's speaking to you. It's the atmosphere that you're in. You get in demonic atmospheres and you want to do devilish things. But if you get in an atmosphere where the favor of God is in the house, 
what the blessings of God are, where people are expecting God to do something exceptional. Expectation puts a demand on the Holy Ghost for God to begin to move in your life so that even when you're down, that's the time to believe God. I can't control miracles. I can't make God give me a miracle, but I can believe for one. And while I'm believing, I set my faith out. My faith puts an expectation on the demands of the Holy Ghost to begin to move. It's just like, Jesus, I need you. I need you. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lord, I look to you. I look toward you and my hope is in you, dear Lord Jesus. I'm trusting you. And this is why whenever you get into a place, it's what you feed your mouth, is what you feed your mind, is what you feed the meditations of your heart. You have to feed yourself the right diet. What am I feeding myself? And I'm so grateful because Elijah here, who's burned out, who's depressed, did he serve God? Absolutely. He was a servant of God, but he got burned out. Because he was doing right and bad things were still happening to him. You know sometimes that when you stand for your conviction, not everybody will celebrate it. You do what's right and end up getting ridden up for it. You can sometimes suffer penalty for doing what's right, for standing up for your convictions. For the right thing, doing the right thing, and then you get persecuted. And it's like, Lord, why don't you let this happen to me? I'm trying to do what's right. And you think that if you do what's right, the world is going to celebrate you, not when you live in a fallen world and you're dealing with corrupt people who have corrupt motives and they are egotistical and self-centered and they want all of the glory. And you think that if you do what's right, that people are going to celebrate you? Think again. This is a fallen world. And that's why we have to be committed to do what's right, not because you get celebrated or rewarded for it, but because it is right. And we are pleasing the one who called us and put us on assignment here in this life. And whether anybody sees it or not, it doesn't matter. I'm doing this because of God who's in my life. I live for God. Uh, He is my pleasure. And and my heart is committed to him. And I'm doing what's right because it is right. And I want to have peace with God in my heart and in my mind and serve God with joy. And this is where Elijah is. He's feeling that I've been doing the right thing. God, I stood up for you. I called fire down from heaven and now I'm running for my life. What's up with this? I'm tired of this. Lord, kill me. I'm no better than my relatives. Kill me. Take me to be with you. I'm ready to go home early. You know, when God calls you to do something, he will never, ever accept a resignation. I don't care how frustrated you are. You know, you'll be, you know, I mean, God, God will put you someplace and you'll be yapping because of the mate that God brought into your life and you're just complaining about him. God, like, you know, wah, 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 wah. He's like, you're still going to stay right there. You're going to stay right there. You'll get over it. You need a nap and a snack. <laughs> a nap and a snack. I'm just telling you. Sometimes a nap and a snack will fix it. I'm just telling you, just don't try to deal with it right now. Go to sleep. Don't try to talk about everything. Go to sleep. A nap and a snack. You just need a nap and a snack. Now, sometimes you might want to smack your children. You need a nap and a snack. Because if you come at the wrong time when mama's tired, she needs a nap, or she's hangry, she needs a snack, you're liable to get your head snapped off. A nap and a snack is so critical. I never will forget my dad had gone out of town one time and, and uh, all of my other brothers had motorcycles and I wanted a motorcycle. I had sense enough because my dad was a business owner and he was under pressure. I strategically waited until my daddy had been over into Jamaica for a solid month on vacation. And daddy came back. He was so rested and so relaxed and so cool and calm and copacetic. And I knew that he had eaten. (laughs) He'd had a nap and a snack. And I went in for the big ask. And I said, Dad, I want a motorcycle. You know I got my motorcycle? (laughs) Because Dad had had a nap and a snack. And I got my motorcycle with absolutely no prompt. Timing is everything. 
It is absolutely everything. A nap and a snack. I'm telling you, please don't go in for a raise and ask for a raise. If your boss has not had a nap and a snack. <laughs> I'm just... Salespeople do it. It's still whining and dining. It's a nap and a snack. It's a feel good. It's putting you in a relaxed position to where you feel good before they make the ask. And here they are now. God is telling Elijah, Elijah, I know you're burned out right now, but you just need a nap and a snack. So he let him get his nap and then the angel woke him up to get his snack. He already had the nap. Now he wakes him up to get a snack. He says, rise and eat. And then he, 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 he woke up and he ate and then he laid down again. Because the first time that he ate, I think he was replenishing the energy of all that the journey had taken out of him. Sometimes you just need to eat just to replenish all of the energy that you have just expended, just to restore, just to renew, just to get you back to square one. Then he laid down and slept again. And the angel touched him the second time and said, rise up and eat again. Because the journey where you're going is great and you're going to need this energy for where you're going. The second time you eat has nothing to do with where you've been and what you've been through. It has everything to do with where you're going. You got to feed yourself not for where you are, but for where you are going. And so if I'm going to a place, it might mean going back to school and getting trained and certified in this particular area. Start feeding yourself, your mouth, your mind, and the meditations of your heart for where you're going, for where you're going, not where you are. The first time you eat, you're replenishing the energy of where you've been. But the second time that you rise to eat, you need to feed yourself for where you're going. If you're building for a competition, you better feed yourself for where you're going. This is not about right now. This is about where I'm going. I'm trying to build muscle now. I'm trying to build myself to this position because I'm headed to this position in life. You've got to start feeding yourself for where you are going. And when God is calling you to do something beyond anything that you've ever mastered in your past, you got to feed yourself on another level. You've got to reach the people that's beyond your little social group that's in your little clique of where you are right now. You've got to get somebody else who's on another level because God is trying to shift you. you don't, you got to understand how to think, how to rest, how to deal, how to manage on this level. You know how to, do, how to make a cupcake, it's time now to make a sheet cake because God says, I'm trying to multiply your money now. And you got to understand how to be profitable with a cupcake before I bring you a sheet cake. Once you learn how to do it in the boot, in the back, in the corner, in the dark, I'm going to put the spotlight on you, but I want you to get it right back here before I shift you up here. You got to start thinking on another level. God says, I see you, and I'm going to put you in the midst of people that are on another level so you can start feeding yourself for where you're going. Put it in your mouth. Put it in your mind. Start meditating it in your heart. Who am I talking to in this place today? I don't know where you're going, but you got to find somebody who's not in the car with you, but somebody who's in the car ahead of you. You've got to be able to hook up with somebody that feeds you for where you are going. That says, listen, on this level, you don't have time to respond to everybody's comment on their social media. Keep your mouth shut, hold your peace, keep your peace, and move on and do what I've called you to do. you got to stay connected and feed yourself for where you are going. It's amazing. And let me just tell you this. I learned this the hard way over the years because I felt that if God called you to do something, that you would love everything about it. And I discovered you love some things about it, but you don't love everything about it. There are some elements that you don't necessarily enjoy, but they go along with the territory. Yes, and mothers and fathers love having children because we love, you know, when babies coo and they smile at us, but then they poop and throw up. <laughs> it's not all pleasant. You like parenting, but you don't like being up with a sick child at night, but it goes along with the territory. So every time that you're called to do something, there are elements of that call that are unpleasant. Yeah. 
You never get burned out by the elements that you love to do. You get burned out by the stuff that supports what you love to do. See, notice, you're never burned out from doing what you love to do. We burn out from doing those things that support what we love to do. We love to play, we love to perform, but we hate to practice. And the practice saps your energy. Who likes it? Dun, 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 dun. Really? 45 minutes doing that? But you got to do that if you want to be able to really flow and play in the spirit and create on the spot and recreate melodies that you hear in your head that you've never played before. You got to be able to get the foundations down. Feed yourself on that level. That's the unpleasantries of just having to practice, 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 practice. I had somebody to say this to me once. And uh, they, they said, you know, do you think that as much as you speak, that people remember all of your messages? And I said, you know, it's not necessarily important that they remember all of my messages. I said, I don't remember what I ate last Sunday. <laughs> but what I ate last Sunday is helping to keep me alive now. I may not remember next Next Sunday, what I eat today. But if I don't eat, it is the faithfulness that carries you through. The faithfulness, the faithfulness. I don't remember what I ate yesterday, but I'm, I'm living off of his strength today. And the only thing that I know that I, I mean, I don't remember what all I ate during the pandemic, but I'm still here. It is the faithfulness that takes you to the end. He that is faithful unto the end. It is your faithfulness. It is not that it's so outstanding that I remember that I had the ribeye. The bone-in ribeye with mac and cheese. Lobster mac and cheese. I, I, you can't eat like that every day. And it doesn't have to be that every day because the things that grows people into being strong, healthy folks might have been oatmeal, but you don't remember your oatmeal. You don't remember the, the vegetables and the cornbread, but it'll build you into something that'll be able to, to perform well down the road. And it's just the faithfulness of it, not by how sensational and memorable it is. God will take the ordinary and work his power through the ordinary. It is his putting his super on our natural that makes us supernatural to the world. So it doesn't have to be so spectacular. Just be faithful in what God calls you to do. And sometimes that humdrum faithfulness of just doing the same thing, reading your Bible, saying your prayers, you know, speaking these confessions out, feeding your mouth, feeding your mind, feeding the meditations of your heart. It's your faithfulness in doing it that becomes the hammer of the word. It is the faithfulness. It is the consistency in doing this thing that begins to chisel the character of the king in your heart. It is the faithfulness. It is the faithfulness. It's not about being so exceptional and outstanding. It is about being faithful. It's about being faithful. It's about being faithful. But here the prophet Elijah was experiencing what I consider to be burnout. And let me just give you some behavioral signs and symptoms of burnout. Withdrawing from responsibilities. Detachment, where you begin to isolate yourself from other people. It's a sign of burnout. This is not just tired, this is burnout. Procrastinating, taking longer to get things done. When you start using food or drugs or alcohol in order to cope, it's a sign of burnout. When you start taking your frustration out on others, burnout. You start skipping work or coming in late and leaving early, burnout. Difficulty concentrating, burnout. Anxiety, lack of creativity, burnout. Fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. Where you have, you're, you're listless. You, you're in this funk. It's a sign of burnout. Insomnia, uh, headaches, muscle aches, pain. It's a sign of burnout. 
And it's really difficult to be around burned out people. Stephen Hawkins said this. He says, people will not have time for you if you're always angry and complaining. If you're always angry or complaining, folks don't want to be around you. You need a nap and a snack. <laughs> they just don't. They just don't want to be around you. And I love something that Marcus Aurelius said. He says that there's never any need to get worked up about anything that you can't control. Never get worked up about anything that you can't control. Control the controllables. You can control what you can control. If you can't control it, don't get, no need to get worked up over it. Losing your mind and your peace and your sleep over something that you have no control over. Just let it go. Let it go. I love the practicality of the Apostle Paul when he's writing to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11. Notice what he said. He says, make it your goal. Make it your goal to live a quiet life. Minding your own business. Good God Almighty. Woo! My God, that's a message all by itself. Please get a screenshot of that. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, not be a loud mouth. Minding your own business, not dibbling, dabbling, trying to tell everybody how to live their life. Minding your own business and working with your own hands just as we instructed you before. He said, we told you this before. Make it your goal to live a quiet life minding your own business. Minding your own business. But it seems like to me that Will Smith and Jada minding your own business. Look like Mike Tyson and this man minding your own business. Working with your hands, doing what God called you to do, staying faithful to your assignment as we instructed you before. Keep building, stay on the, on the wall. A tool in one hand and a weapon in the other so that you don't get distracted by stuff that's trying to throw you off from your destiny. You're called here to do a job on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. I'm on assignment. And yes, I'm going to have disappointments and heartaches, but I have got to be able to take a nap, get me some rest, and get up to feed myself not only for what I've been through, but what I've got to go through in order to get to where God has called me to get to and to be who he's called me to be. I've got to start feeding myself on another level. I need people that's already ahead of me, people that are above me. I need somebody because you have to understand that when you need to be promoted, you can't be promoted from somebody that's under you. It's got to be somebody that has the authority who's over you. That's why you got to get with somebody who's on another level and feed yourself for where you're going. Feed your mouth, feed your mind, feed the meditations of your heart. Your diet is all of these things, what you eat, what you listen to, who you listen to, who's in your life, whose posts you follow, who's influencing you. It's so much more than what you do with your knife and your fork. It has everything to do with the atmospheres that you get in. There are some atmospheres that challenge you. They challenge you to grow. You need to get around some atmospheres that make you uncomfortable so you grow. You need to be in some atmospheres where you just keep your mouth shut and mind your own business because you'll you talk yourself out of your own blessing. You're not like, you're not like, I don't even belong here. I don't even know how I got here. I may just be here serving hors d'oeuvres, but God has you in the room serving hors d'oeuvres for a reason. He's got you hobnobbing and rubbing elbows and being exposed to something and just watching and learning how to carry yourself so that when you get in the, in the atmosphere by invitation that you know how to carry yourself with grace like you belong because I have been here before. You got to come as a guest sometimes and serve your way into greatness. And sometimes you might just be in the room and say anything else. It is my pleasure. And then after a while, when you are in the room by invitation, somebody else will be there with a tray and say, it is my pleasure. You have to serve the anointing that you want to flow down into your life. I'm just here to tell you, you've got to feed yourself for where you are going. Feed yourself for where you're going. Feed yourself for where you are going. It's amazing. Rest is a gift to the righteous because rest requires obedience. Notice what Isaiah chapter 57 verse 20 and 21 says. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest. 
Notice that. They can't rest. Whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace or rest, says my God, for the wicked. That's why when you keep doing wrong, you look old before you get old. There's no rest for the wicked. You know, there's something about rest that refreshes you, that renews your youth like the eagles. I'm just telling you. But we have to obey God in order to enter into his rest. I want you to notice what the word of the Lord says in Hebrews chapter 4. Notice verse 1 through 4 and then 7 through 11. It says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for others, God said, in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. You have to have faith in you and enter with those that believe in order to enter into the rest of the Lord. They will never enter my rest, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it is ready because of the place in the scripture where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And if you know God rested, you know we've got to rest. Verse 7, so God set another time for entering his rest, another time, and that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted, today when you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fall. We have to cease doing our works in order to enter into God's rest. We have to cease doing our works and begin to do God's work to experience God's rest. Cease your labors to enter into his rest. Now, listen, you won't have rest appropriately in your life until you do what you need to do. This is why the scripture says, labor to enter into his rest. After you've done what you, you should have done, there's a rest that comes to you. You know, like if you've got an, an aging parent, and if you've been there and have served them in their time of sickness and deterioration, and you've been there for them, and you've done what you could do, when you've done the labor, when it's time for them to take their rest, there's a rest in your soul. There's a peace that I did. I served them. I did what I needed to do. I took care of them. I provided money for them. I did this. I did the other. When you've done what was necessary, then you enter into the rest. But if you don't do what you need to do, if you don't labor, you can't enter the rest. I was always, I'm, I'm a natural academician. So when I was in school, I, I never, ever spent one night in all of my years of education of staying up the night before a test to cram. I never crammed for the final exam, never. Not, not, not the kid, <laughs> not me. I slept well all night. Got up and had a nice snack in the morning before it was time for me to go and take my test. I always labored so that I could rest because I couldn't get in the bed without my homework being finished. That was a part of my responsibility. I didn't rest well. It's, it, I, I tossed and turned. I tried one night. I said, I'll finish this in the morning. And I got in the bed and I'm sitting up there looking at the ceiling. I'm like, what in the world is wrong with me? My parents weren't telling me to do this. I carried the yoke of responsibility. And I said, I can't rest until, and I had to get my behind out of the bed and finish my work so that I could rest. I had to labor to enter into the rest. Because if you don't do what you need to do, when you need to do it, you're not going to be able to rest when you're filled with anxiety over what you should have done earlier. So 
you labor to enter into the rest so you could rest the night before. I could barely wait. Respect during the, the 70s when I was a teenager and, and, and here I am ready to take my driver's exam. I was so afraid. We were, we were experiencing a gas shortage. And I'm like, doggone it, these adults are going to burn up all the gas before I even get a chance to drive. <laughs> and now I don't even want to drive. I want to call an Uber, a Lyft. But at the time, I had never driven and I wanted to be able to drive. And so I, I, I'm the night before I turned 15, and I went on my birthday when I turned 15 to get my learner's license. And, 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 the, and the guy told me, he said, son, you must have really studied for this test. <laughs> I said, yes, I studied to pass and not to fail. He said, son, you made a flat 100. <laughs> yeah, that's because I would read that book backward and forward and forward and backward, and I knew everything that was in it. I knew the Georgia law as it related to driving and I made a flat 100 on the test and I slept well the night before I took it because I had already labored so that I could enter into his rest. But when you haven't done what you could do and should do, there's no rest to you. It's like, oh my God, oh God, oh God. You're biting your nails. You're hangry. And you can't rest because you didn't do what you need to do. That's why obedience is connected to the rest. And that's why the Bible says that there remains a rest for the people of God. Because there is no rest for the wicked. The people that serve their own flesh. That do what they want to do. That live their own truth. You got to live God's truth. There's only one truth. It's the truth that God has established from the foundation. Don't, you're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. To assume that you can live your truth as you live in the world by yourself and your actions don't affect anybody else. That is the truth. Truth is not subjective. Truth transcends time and geography. Real truth. If something is truth, it's true whether you're in Africa, Asia, South America, Europe, North America. It's true all over the world. It's truth. Truth is universal. And it transcends time. If it was truth for your great-grandmother, it's truth today. Truth never changes. What is true may change, but truth never changes. It might have been true in 1900 that man couldn't go to the moon. That was true, but it wasn't truth. And that's why that changed. But truth never changes. Build your life on truth. Truth never changes. And God is the one who is the author of all truth. It ultimately goes back to God. Now, here's what I say to you. Elijah needed a nap and he needed a snack. And one of the reasons that he needed a nap is because rest is medicine. Rest is medicine. I use it as an acronym. The aura is recreation. Recreation. Recreation is not inactivity, it's a change of activity. You can be refreshed, not from doing nothing, but changing your activity. Recreation, I don't, it could be basketball, volleyball, soccer, whatever. Recreation is a change of activity, it is not inactivity. That's why a man can be tired and he can go to the gym and recreate. Notice, recreation is nothing but recreation. But it's movement doing a different activity than what you've been doing all day. And you can be bone tired and go to the gym and expend energy and actually get energy. If you go to the gym tired, you leave energized, not depleted in energy. You give energy to get energy. You reap what you sow. It's a part of recreation. It is not inactivity. It's a change of activity. Rest is a part of recreation is a part of rest. The E is enjoyment. Do some other things that you enjoy. I don't care whether it's reading, whether it's having a picnic out by the lake. Uh, do something that you enjoy where you lose track of time. You can go down in your basement and listen to some jazz music. Whatever it is that, that you enjoy, as long as it, as it is legal, This, it should not be illegal, it should not be illicit, and it should not be immoral. So I have to give some caveats here, you know. <laughs> 
But other than that, enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. There are many legal and moral ways to be able to enjoy yourself. So recreation, enjoyment, the S is sleep. Sleep, 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 sleep. Unplug from the digital world. Turn off your notifications. Get some sleep. It'll, it'll, the, the world will still be here when you wake up. Get some sleep. Get some sleep. Unplug. Recreation, enjoyment, sleep. I love something that John Beckman said. He said, it is a common experience that a difficult, a problem that is difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the committee of sleep has worked on it. Have you ever struggled with something at night and then in the morning you just somehow know what to do? It's like you have your answer. The committee of sleep has worked on it and sleep can help bring things into clarity and, uh, and, and you'll have a, a resolve in the morning. But the, but the T here is transcend, uh, transcension. Transcension. Transcension is about submitting to God's will, knowing that God's plan is better than anything that you could ever come up with on your own. Transcension is where you rise above what you don't have the power to change. You rise above it. You transcend. If you really want rest, you have to rise above it. Here's what I mean. You're in relationship with somebody. They've already, already gotten on you because you don't listen to them when they talk. And they are now wah, 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 and you can't stop them from talking. And you have to sit there. Or you're at work and your boss brings you in. And they have you in a boring meeting. And you really want to shoot yourself in the head. You identify with Elijah. You, you're suicidal. In all of my years of ministry, I only had one time that I was counseling with a lady that I started thinking suicidal thoughts <laughs> while she was talking. And I had to practice this, this T here of transcension. So while she was still talking, womp, 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 my mind, I was in Maui, Hawaii. <laughs> I transcended. I don't even know how I got there, but somehow I was on the beach in Maui and I was looking at the ocean and womp, 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 womp. I guess she thought that I was in deep thought and meditation that maybe that God was speaking to me like I had gone in a trance. No, I wasn't in a trance. I had transcended. I had already left the room, but my body was there. I'm sure that my eyes were probably glazed over, but I had transcended. Sometimes when you need a rest, and you can't leave the room, leave the room through your imagination. Transcend. If you can't change it, you change. Transcend. You rise above it. You get to the place where this thing, under normal circumstances, your mouth would have offended me. Your attitude would have offended me. Your tone would have offended me. But now I transcend. I rise above it. And sometimes I rise above it by just simply saying, you know what? They can't help it. They don't mean me any harm. That's just who they are. And I have to just tell myself that. And sometimes I, 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 I giggle on the inside because I'm like, you know what? I've had to tell myself. I had this conversation the other day. I was talking to someone. And I said, you know, they're nagging. They're complaining. They're, they're fault finding. And this thought crossed my mind. You could be them. And somehow I got tickled on the inside. <laughs> And while they were still going on, I, I just, I'm transcended. I'm already lifted out of the situation and my soul is at rest. And so sometimes, if you can't leave the room, leave the room. Transcend. Transcend. It'll bring a rest to your soul. It'll be a rest to your soul when you still have to be trapped in a neighborhood that you don't like or on a job that you don't like for the moment and you don't have the power and the resources to be able to change your situation right at the moment. Transcend. Transcend. It takes God in your life. And it's where God will have brought something in that he allows you to be able to feed yourself. And may I remind you of this? The biggest example, I think, in Scripture that we really see of a nap and a snack it's when Jesus had a last supper and he invited his 12 apostles to be there. And it was time for him to be crucified. He had a dinner the night before. He had dinner 
the night before. That was his snack. And then he died up on the cross and took a three-day nap. But when he took a nap, it meant he was going to get up. He went to sleep knowing that he was going to get up. When Jesus went to Tabitha's grave to raise little Tabitha, the room where she had died, and he said, Talitha Kumi, he put all of the doubt, the doubters, the naysayers out of the room. You have to put unbelief out when you believe in God for a miracle. And he kept saying, she's not dead, she's only sleep. Because sleep means able to be recovered. Able to be recovered. And there are some things that God wants you to know is not dead, is able to be recovered. It's not dead, it's able to be recovered. The dream is not dead, it's able to be recovered. The vision that God gave you is not dead, it's able to be recovered. It's dormant right now, it's just sleep, it is not dead. Is able to be recovered. And Jesus touched the little girl's hands, Talitha Kumi, Arise, daughter. He got her up. She had a nap and said, get this girl something to eat. A nap and a snack. Some of you are killing yourself because you've not been feeding your mouth, your mind, nor the meditations of your heart right. You've not been feeding yourself for where you're going. You're starved. And somehow you needed a resource of something that poured into you when you're in the current and you have no example before you because you haven't had any of that food of where you're going. And your soul got exasperated because you began to feel if this is all that's to it, I don't want to keep living like this. There's always more than meets the eye. And this is why Jesus said, I have come that you might have life in John 10, 10 and have it more abundantly. The thief comes to rob, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. And when Jesus had his snack and then his nap, a three-day nap, when he got up from there, where he was going was a place that was back to glory. It transcended anything that this earth has to offer us. And when you allow yourself to have a rest in God because you've done what God told you to do, you just do what God tells you to do and then draw back and say, God, it's time for me to lay down and take my nap now. I've already planted the seed. I've already watered. Now I go to bed and I get up and the Bible says the seed grows up. It springs up on its own. God will cause what you've been planting in faithfulness, 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 faithfulness. I may not remember what I talked about two weeks ago, but it, I'm living off of it. I don't know what I had to eat on Sunday two weeks ago, but I'm living off of it. It's strengthening something in me. It gave me the strength for the next day and the day after that. And so you have to feed yourself. And rest in God by just saying, God, I'm going to do what you called me to do. Because until you do what God calls you to do, you can't rest. Trust me, God does not accept resignations. God will refire you. He'll fire you up again. But he will not say, you know what, okay, yeah, I accept your resignation. You know, when you try to hand God your resignation, he starts laughing at you. Because he knows something that you don't know. And he knows really that all you need is a nap and a snack. Some of you all are on the point of burnout right now. You're irritable. You're impatient. You're judgmental. You snap on people. You're negative. You're critical. You're intolerant. And you just need a nap and a snack. You need to enter into the rest of God and allow the peace of God that passes all understanding to guard your heart and mind by Christ Jesus. There remains a rest for the people of God. I tell you this prophetically today. There remains a rest for the people of God when you feel like killing yourself and when you cannot see God's purpose 
you want to take your own life. But there remains a purpose, a rest for the people of God. And whether you realize it right now, this is a part of your snack, giving you the strength to go for another 40 days, not just to get you through the week, not just to get you through the month, it gets you beyond the month. When Elijah ate this food, it took him 40 days. The first time he ate, it was just to replenish what had been taken out of him. But the second time that he rose and ate, it was to feed him for where he was going into his destiny. And God's trying to feed you because he's calling you into a place of destiny. Bigger than anything that you have imagined. More than what you feel worthy of. And you've been brought into atmospheres and room and given positions that your resume really cannot substantiate and validate to say that you really deserve this position. But God, in his infinite mercy and his goodness, he's better to you than what you deserve. I don't, can anybody identify? Will you just be honest with yourself and just testify and say, it's me. He's been better to me than what I deserve. Better to me than what I deserve better than me than what I deserve and even when you feel stressed out to say God God has taken so long when God he says enter into my rest then get up and I'm going to feed you something and maybe if you'll rest right in the obedience of God God will feed you in a dream Go back and listen to your dreams. Go back and record your dreams. For it was food. Angel food. Pointing you to a destiny that lies ahead. It has drawing power that will motivate you to go beyond where you are and show your roadmap of things that already exist for you. If you will walk in faithfulness toward it, you shall arise and enter into it with great rest and peace, says the Lord. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Ooh, glory, 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 glory. Uh, God sees you. He sees you. He sees the tiredness. He sees the burnout. He sees the weariness in your soul. The Lord sees you. Stay faithful to what he fed you in the dream. I don't know who this is for, but stay faithful. It has been with great specificity and intentionality that it was given to you. You were called to steward this. Carry it like a mother until it is birth, says the Lord. You walk in obedience, and I heard the Lord say, I will assemble the team. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Woo, glory. Mare bibiosi te keriata. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I heard the Lord say that he will turn what was a burial ground into a birthing ground. It's not dead, it will be recovered in the name of Jesus. It's not dead, it will be recovered in the name of Jesus. It will be recovered. He, you will recover all. You will recover all. Everything God promised. Everything God said. You will recover all. 
you will recover all. You will recover all. You'll get your joy back. You'll get the connections back. You'll get your reputation back. You'll get your strength back. You'll get your motivation back. You'll get your impetus back. You'll get your energy back. You'll get it back. You'll get your focus back. <laughs> Glory to God. If you know that you're pregnant with something from God, meet me here at this altar here. This is a birthing ground. This is a birthing ground. You're carriers. Men can be pregnant with purpose from God. You're carriers of his purpose. You're carriers of destiny. You're birthing something that's bigger than you. This is bigger than you. This is bigger than you. But it's not bigger than God. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above everything that you're able to ask or think. Above, above that. Whatever the, your biggest, wildest dream, God's able to do above that. Above that. And what you've been carrying has been a long night. You've had birthing pains. You've had false labor pains. But you're carrying something and you realize, Lord, I realize that I'm carrying this in my spirit, in my belly. I've been carrying it for some time now. But the Lord is the one that has to give us that birthing experience. That way he'll give you a supernatural divine release. And you've been weeping and you didn't realize that this was the breaking of your water. The water has been broken. The water has been broken. Hey, glory. The water has been broken. But you're going to deliver this thing. It's born of God. Whatever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. <laughs> Slip one hand up to God as a sign of surrender. It is a way of saying that, God, I cannot do this alone, that I do this by your hand, by your strength. It is because the hand of the Lord is upon you. It's because God put in your belly what's in your belly. He put the dream. He's the author of it. And whatever God offers, he will finish it. He will finish it. He will finish it. He will cause the birthing to come. You go into a travail, but you labor to enter into the rest. And after the birth, there will come such a sound, sweet sleep, a deep rest, a deep sleep will come upon you in the name of Jesus. Some of you are mothers like Rachel, the voice of Rachel, weeping for her children. But they that sow in tears will reap in joy. Reap in joy. Reap in joy. Hey! This is a birthing ground. It's a birthing ground. It's a birthing ground. You're carrying something given by God. Say these words, use me, God. Fill me, God. Pour through me, God. Strengthen me, God. Empower me, God. Embolden me, God. To birth 
what you've placed in me. I consecrate it back to you. It is yours. Born for your glory. Made for your honor. Created for your glory. Now come through me. Flow through my life. Flow through my thoughts. Anoint my mouth. Anoint my mind. Anoint the meditations of my heart. Oh God, bring me into a divine rest so that this thing is birthed. May it not be hindered by any demonic force. But may it open. May every closed thing open. Till the waters flow. Till the blood flows. Till the sacrifice flows. So that the birth will come. And your purpose will enter the earth. And you will be glorified. Lord of all. In Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We consecrate it to him today. We consecrate it to him today. We consecrate it to him today. In the name of Jesus. 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 Name of Jesus. Pregnant with children. Pregnant with children. Pregnant with vision. Pregnant with businesses. Pregnant with books. Pregnant with scripts. Pregnant with power, pregnant with choreographies, pregnant, 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 pregnant with ideas, pregnant, 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 until there's a birthing in the earth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Pregnant with strategy, pregnant with wisdom, pregnant with favor. God's hand is upon you. To be able to do great things in the earth. It is God who will do it. You watch him. You mark this day. Mark this day that something shifted. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. <laughs> My, there will come such a rest to you tonight in the name of Jesus. A rest to your mind to the weariness of your soul, to your finances, God's bringing relief, 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 relief. The struggle is over. The struggle is over. The struggle is over. Cease struggling. Cease struggling. Cease struggling. Cease warring and fighting with this thing now. Enter into the rest of the Lord. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our sight. This is the Lord's doing. It's the Lord's doing. It's the Lord's doing it is marvelous in our sight it is the Lord's doing it is marvelous in our sight God has us right in his hands right in his hands father we give ourselves to you today and we say, Lord, you have your way in the hearts and the lives of your people. Will you birth, God, what will please you and what brings glory to your name, God, and what begins to transform and shift in the earth everything that you've designed and desired to come in us and through us, God. We're just vessels, God. Use us for your glory, for your glory, for your glory. Lord, a whole nation of priests, use them for your glory to make a difference in the sphere of influence where you've given them. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that their gift makes room for them. Ha! Ah, glory, 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 glory. Glory, glory, glory. As they rest, God, let them be healed in every affliction that is in their body. May strength come. May you cause every neurological disorder to come into order even now. Every cell in their body to come into the alignment with your word and may strength and renewal and power now fill them God give them strength to deliver strength to deliver strength to deliver strength to deliver 
what comes because of contractions don't come because of what we're doing but what you caused nature to do in us so that it produces through us everything that you desire thank you for every contraction pain that we feel because it's leading toward birth birth that will change and shift thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Lord may you have your way you're our awesome provider God you provide you provide you provide Jesus you're our provider you're the one who does it while we're still here at the altar just the worship team can come back if you all can just do a little bit more of that God provides just while you're just here out of your heart just talk to God God provides he provides such an awesome provider he's a provider He's in the room. He's feeding you by the atmosphere. Sheraba Solotoma.
hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.